Hi, this is Dr. Thomas Armstrong. Welcome to week 10, the last week of my course, Introduction to Neurodiversity. In this module, we're going to be doing a little bit of summing up. Well, actually, what I'm going to be doing is first taking a big picture look at neurodiversity, a macro view. And I'll, that'll be a very short part of the presentation. And then I want to really focus in on some micro and practical, pragmatic views of neurodiversity, particularly as pertains to special education. First, though, I'd like you to reflect on what you feel has been the most important thing you have learned in this course. You've written so many wonderful things, so many ideas have uh, been shared and, and discussed. What really struck you as the most important thing you've learned? Okay, first the macro view. I wanted to situate neurodiversity within the larger context of diversity. And I like this particular diagram, although it was missing biodiversity. And so I decided to put it in myself and I put it in the center because it seems that biodiversity is really foundational. Um, it's really talking about the diversity of life, the foundation that allows us to have life and to have good lives. And that funnels into all uh, the different forms of diversity that exist among human beings in, in, as individuals or as groups. And looking at the different kinds of diversity, we can situate neurodiversity as one part of the disability paradigm, although there's a part of me that would like to make it a separate slice, so to speak. But then we need to relate it and understand that it is part and parcel with other forms of diversity sexual orientation, for example. There are a lot of connections between neurodiversity and the LGBTQ movement. Uh, religious diversity, honoring the different traditions and the different ideas that there are different paths to the truth. Gender diversity, something that uh, we think now of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's worked so tirelessly on behalf of women to give them legal equity in the culture and age, being able to listen to our elders. In fact, to any stage of life, I've actually written a book called The Human Odyssey. And in that book, I suggest that every stage of life, and I have 12 stages of life, offers a particular gift to humanity. Elders offer us wisdom. Babies offer us vitality. Uh, early childhood offers us playfulness and so forth. And so being open and awake to the wonders and diversities of different ages can be a whole new way of appreciating diversity. Of course, race and ethnicity being a very important part and a very controversial part of our culture right now with so much emphasis on, on the one hand, a, a racist approach to life and the, on the other hand, an honoring of all races. Cultural diversity, very much the same thing, honoring different cultures for what they have to give us. And then finally, disability diversity. And when we look at all these different kinds of diversity, first of all, one of the things that struck me was they all have obstacles in their way, usually in the form of human attitudes. So with sexual orientation, that becomes homophobia. Uh, for gender, it becomes sexism. For age, it becomes ageism. For race, it becomes racism. For disability, it becomes ableism. The idea that if you uh, are normal, you would walk on the, on the sidewalk and not need to use a wheelchair. That kind of you know, approach, this sort of normal-centric approach to life. So I just wanted to have in this summing up uh, presentation a kind of a big picture view to remind us that neurodiversity 
forms a part of a larger picture of diversity that we really are fighting for when we fight for neurodiversity. When we look at all of the other rights movements uh, for greater respect for LG LGBTQ communities, for different religious traditions, for uh, men and women equity, for different age groups, for different races, we're really looking at the same kind of fight, which is really going into ourselves and developing an ethos of respect and regarding different diversities with a great deal of um, honor and integrity. So that's just what I wanted to say about the macro view of neurodiversity. Now I want to spend the rest of my presentation focusing on the micro view. In the readings this week, there was an article I wrote for educational leadership uh, where I focused on how neurodiversity suggests that we need to completely restructure our concept of what special education is. And I have a chart in there that looks at both the deficit-based and strength-based uh, components that should exist or have existed in special ed. So the focus in a deficit-based special education program is diversity, strength-based approach, excuse me, is disability, a strength-based approach is diversity. The assessment methods for deficit-based are testing for deficits, strength-based are assessing strengths and challenges. Instructional approaches for the deficit-based is remediating weaknesses, and for the strength-based is building on strengths and using those strengths to overcome challenges. Some of the theoretical foundations of traditional special education are uh, genetics and neurobiology, as well as I probably should add behaviorism. A strength-based approach relies more on findings from evolutionary psychobiology and social and ecological theory. The view of the brain in a deficit-based special education program is of a brain that's damaged, dysfunctional, and or disordered whereas a strength-based approach is viewing that brain as part of natural human variation. The program goals of a traditional special education program are meeting instructional objectives. This is certainly a part of the strength-based approach, but the wider view is that ultimately we want to be helping to develop the potential of each individual within the special education system. And finally, the way we explain to students about their difference or their disability also differs. The deficit-based approach tends to take a learning to live with your disability kind of approach, whereas a strength-based approach involves more of a learning to maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses kind of approach. Now there are some formidable obstacles to change, to systemic change, the kind of systemic change that I suggested in this chart that we have to confront, that I did write about in that educational leadership article. Uh, one of the biggest challenges is the simple, pragmatic, administrative need for a disability label. This is a chart showing the number of uh, rates, rather, the rates, the percentages of how many, uh, from year to year, how many nationally, uh, how many kids have been enrolled in special education. And then the blue line is how many people in Texas. And the article that this was taken from was basically an article that said, we're not finding enough special education students. We're under our quota. We should be um, finding more kids with special education uh, needs. So there's that push. Um, there's also that push in advocacy groups, um, whether it be dyslexia or autism. There are campaigns to raise awareness about the disabling features of each of these categories. 
And, you know, I, I put it this way, nobody's going to get funding for a disability that has too many gifts in it. Um, that might be saying it too bluntly, but I think the idea is oftentimes um, there seems to be a, dis the, a term management issue in advocacy groups where they need to make the disability um, not too, not too um, severe or people will get scared and not want to have their child identified in that way. And they can't make it too nice, too good, too uh, flowery, or people won't give money because who's not who's going to give money for something that's not a disability in this case? So how do we get around that? I want to suggest what seems like a simple solution, although it might be easier said than done, and that is having a two-pronged approach. We should use a if we have to, and it seems like pragmatically, we have to use a deficit paradigm to get kids into the special education uh, programs. So when it comes to qualifying for special ed, let's use the deficit paradigm. Let's use the instruments, the deficit instruments that need to show there is you know, significant discrepancies between achievement and potential, for example. But once the child is in the special education program receiving the services, let's switch tactics and use a strength-based paradigm. It's kind of a stealth approach in a way. Um, the, the deficit paradigm can be loudly proclaimed and, and obviously part of the administrative uh, data collection. Whereas the strength-based paradigm is the way things are practiced, the, um, the um, reality of the situation on the ground. And, and it, it, this probably and most definitely actually does go on in our schools right now, I think. There's so many teachers who are using strength-based practices without even necessarily knowing that they're doing that or not perhaps giving them the uh, level of importance that they deserve. But at any rate, that's kind of an approach for meeting both the needs of the child who needs that strength-based approach and the needs of the administrators and fundraisers who really need to highlight the deficit aspects of each individual diversity. A second challenge to systemic change is what I call chasing normality. Here we have the star results. I think this is from California, showing achievement levels for special education students and non-special education students. And you can see the blue bar does not come up to the orange one. And this is what often concerns, um, in fact, usually concerns most special education teachers and parents. They want their kids to achieve at the same level as anybody else. And they don't want to, and this is the interesting thing, they want the child to be tested just as any other student is tested. Um, so they really are emphasizing their desire that their child approach normality in terms of test results as much as they can. So this puts a lot of pressure on, on teachers. I mean, there are already pressures on teachers to improve test results for neurotypical kids. So for um, neurodiverse kids who will many times have significant greater difficulty achieving those kinds of results, this puts on added pressure, which means that the special ed teacher is gonna focus most of their time on helping to bring that child up to grade level or as close to grade level or or to the testing normality rate as everyone else. Now the solution that I've worked out, and I've said this in different ways in the course, and I would like to say it one last time in a kind of a clear way, and that is that there's two kinds of successes that we should focus on when we're working with neurodiverse kids. The first I call adaptive success. This is helping kids adapt to the world around them. 
teaching the autistic child to socialize to some extent, to, to as much extent as they can, teaching the dyslexic to read, teaching the ADHD kid to attend um, and focus. So that's you know important that we give them those kind of skills. But it's also important that we give kids what I call integral success. And this is really what we're talking about with positive niche construction. It's changing the environment to meet the needs of the child so that child can grow according to their own gifts and according to their own terms. And ultimately, true success is a combination of the two. It's adaptive success plus integral su success equals 100% success. We know we've covered all our bases when we've helped the child to grow according to his own terms, and we've also given them skills to make it easier for them to interact with the outside world or with the world uh, of neurotypicals. Next, I wanna talk about some specific applications that we can use to help make systemic change in special education more likely to occur. And some of them are easily implemented and others perhaps are more dreams. This first one may be more of a dream, but not really because in a sense, we're doing that right now. And that is the idea of creating a new role in a school district. Uh, or in an individual school. We've got resource room teachers, we've got co-teachers, we've got uh, support staff, and this would be in that realm, but it would be explicitly related to neurodiversity. And I suggest that every school and every district have a neurodiversity strengths specialist. Here are some of the qualifications that a neurodiversity strength specialist should have. First, they should be familiar with the strength-based literature. That's the literature that we looked at early in the course when we looked at Maslow and Steiner and Carl Jung, and we looked at uh, uh, the positive psychology movement and so forth. So it's really understanding that literature, the broader literature first, and then developing a familiarity with the literature on strengths in special education populations. And this of course subsumes the material that we've been reading in this course, including this article by Motron, The Power of Autism. Another competency would be the ability to use a wide range of strength-based assessment tools. The Torrance Tests of Creative Thinking, for example. The Devereaux Student Strengths Assessment. The Behavioral and Emotional Rating Scale called the BURS by Michael Epstein. The Clifton Youth Strengths Explorer. There's even a book um, called Tools for Strength-Based Assessment and Evaluation. And I noticed that it has 218 pages. I collected that quite a while back, so I can't tell you a lot about it, except that the authors are Catherine A. Simmons and Peter Lehman. So you might look for that as a resource. Also, the neurodiversity strength specialist would have the ability to look at existing deficit-based oriented uh, assessments and instruments and be able to interpret them in terms of strengths. For example, this is a uh, chart showing this, some subtests from the Wexler Intelligence Scale for Children. And you can look at block design, which we've noted as an indicator of visual spatial intelligence and picture completion being particularly um, and object assembly being particularly uh, emphasized in this profile of this student. So being able to read deficit-based instruments according to the strengths that they can reveal in their subtests. The neurodiversity diversity strength specialist would also have a competence in using a variety of informal strength-based assessment approaches. 
That would include observation of kids, being able to catch students doing their strengths, essentially, the ability to document what they see through photos, through uh, anecdotal uh, writing, through uh, audio files, video files, and so forth. Their ability to look over a student's cumulative files and find the strengths that are there. I used to actually do this when I was a consultant in New York State. I would go into a school district and ask them to give me the CUM file for a, you know, a child they wanted uh, some information on in terms of multiple intelligences. And what I do is have a copy of the CUM file and I go through it and I highlight with a yellow marker anything that had to do with strengths whether it be the highest test scores or grades or the uh, comments made by teachers. And then I would take all that yellow highlighted information and type it up together and hand it out during IEP meetings and other meetings about the student. And this would really make a change. All of a sudden people would be looking at a strength-based profile. And this really had an effect. They began to think, well, now that you mention it, they do do this very well. And now that you point that out, yes, it's true, they do that. Uh, and they start to gather all their strength-based memories of this individual, and they begin to essentially construct a new image of the child, rather than the typical deficit one that seems to hover like a dark cloud over many IEP meetings. Uh, being able to consult with colleagues and get information from them, uh, other teachers uh, and, and other uh, support personnel about what they've observed in the strengths of a student. Uh, consulting with parents, maybe sending home parents with a checklist, maybe with the neurodiversity skills checklist. And then having the ability to sit down with students and ask them about their strongest intelligences, for example. Michael Epstein, who developed the burrs that I just talked about, uh, has what he calls a strength chat for children. And these are just a series of questions that help to elicit uh, ideas that students have about their uh, strengths, about their abilities. Name two good things about your parents. What is your favorite hobby? Tell me about your classes. What's your favorite class? What do you like most about your friends? What's your favorite musician, sport, person? Uh, if, I, if you said one good thing about yourself, what would it be? Simple questions, but that can really uh, evoke from the child their own sense of uh, and perception of themselves as a gifted person, essentially. Essentially, then, this neurodiversity strength-based specialist would be responsible for assessing both formally and informally, both quantitatively and qualitatively, strengths in students in special education. Then she'd be responsible for going in and consulting and actively working with the regular class teacher, with the co-teacher if there is one, with the assistants if they're there, um, and also consulting with administrators and basically advocating for the students' abilities. At, actually helping to build a strength-based picture so that the strategies, and this is another competency that I left out of the chart, but they should have the ability to develop curricula, particularly strength-based strategies that can use those strengths that they've assessed and help that child learn in their areas of need most more effectively. And so that's, you know, they would go into the classroom and demonstrate some of these strength-based strategies and help the teacher to develop their own repertoire of strategies. A second practical application to help us nudge uh, special education programs towards some kind of significant change would be to change the way we do IEP meetings. And that would involve using appreciative inquiry if you'll remember back to our strength-based models module, we talked about briefly about appreciative inquiry uh, developed by a man named Cooper Ryder. And this was first used in the business field, but now has been applied to education. And in particular, a gentleman named 
uh, Peter Kozik took appreciative inquiry and applied it directly to establishing protocols for an IEP meeting. So in the IEP meeting, the first order of business essentially is to ask the student. Of course, the student would be there, an important part of having a strength-based IEP meeting. Tell us about some of your successes this year. What have you done well? What has worked well for you? Asking the same thing to the parent. What have you seen your child doing successfully this year? Same thing with the teachers and specialists. And then to the group, what suggestions can you think of to make the student's program work even better? So we're not talking about bemoaning the fact that we didn't meet all our goals this last term. It's about looking at what worked and how to make it work better. The second protocol in this uh, model is to focus on goals, to ask the student, what would you most love to do when you grow up? What do you think you'll need to do uh, to get what you want to do in life? What have you done so far to get there? And then to ask the same thing to the group, what kind of support and help can we provide? Here we're talking about positive niche construction to make the student's program work toward the goals that he or she has set for him or herself. There's a strong element of student voice in this particular uh, protocol on IEPs. Another simpler and more easily applied approach to bringing neurodiversity into schools and districts would be to have a neurodiversity day, a neurodiversity week, or even a university month or year. Many groups have uh, celebrated Neurodiversity Pride Day. This one takes place on May 19th. Some people celebrate neurodiversity on Autism Pride Day on June 18th. But regardless, regardless of what time, uh, what day of the year it uh, appears on, uh, here's a school district in Canada that's had a neurodiversity day. These can be days when individuals, um, kind of like a science fair, create projects or, or show the projects that they've been working on. Um, a day when there are displays related to positive role models, assistive technologies, where all the tools of positive niche construction can be shown and uh, even demonstrated, and where there can be an honoring, not just of neurodiverse kids, but of all kids, of the diversity, the diverse minds in all kids. And it would be great if every school had a day like this every year. Another way of integrating neurodiversity into the existing uh, status quo, be linking neurodiversity to existing diversity programs in schools. Many, if not most schools today, have some kind of diversity program that focuses on racial, cultural, ethnic diversity. And we can use that as an opening to suggest other forms of diversity that be honored, including neurodiversity. We can also look, and very important that we do look, at professional development. In particular, look at the inclusion component of professional development as an avenue for bringing in neurodiversity. We've talked about inclusion in different parts of this course, but it certainly bears repeating that if inclusion is to succeed in the regular classroom, then there has to be an understanding and an appreciation and a celebration of diversity and neurodiversity in particular. And so in any inclusion uh, professional development seminar, this is a way that we should be able to, now I'm gonna say sneak in, but that's really not the, <laughs> the, the feeling that I think needs to be given to it, um, needs to be brought in as a central part of uh, how to make inclusion work in the classroom. And each teacher then can be given some of the same kinds of skills, the ability to catch strengths. How do we catch strengths in the students? How do we learn to 
uh, appreciate them as strengths? How do we communicate that we know these strengths to our students? How do we develop strength-based strategies? These are all skills that teachers must learn and professional development is key here in terms of giving them the tools and then offering them the opportunity to practice those tools and get feedback uh, in subsequent uh, professional development meetings. Another way that we can apply neurodiversity to special ed, and I think a very dramatic way, is to build strengths into the IEP goal writing process. It's important to note that the federal law on developing an IEP says in developing each child's IEP, the IEP team shall consider Number one, the strengths of the child. It's written into the law. A strength-based approach to special education is written into the law. That means not just that we should do it, but that we must do it. Many states have individual forms that include a section called present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. And this is oftentimes a, an opportunity to uh, enumerate and describe at length, if necessary, the strengths of the student. This is oftentimes given just a sort of a pro forma uh, response, you know, uh, tries hard, um, sense of humor, uh, perseveres, you know, those kind of things that are so general that they really don't evoke a specific image of a child. Whereas once we've done our uh, homework, once we've gathered the information about strengths, we can really lay it down here uh, and make it part of a formal part, a legal part of that student's program. And finally, we should build strengths into the state standards because the state standards are going to be dictating in large part what many of those IEP goals are going to be. And it turns out that the Common Core State Standards issued a, uh, a letter, I guess you'd have to say, um, that focuses on applications to students with disabilities. And I've read, highlighted some of the key phrases here. Supports and accommodations, unique needs of the student, individualized instruction, universal design for learning, presenting information in multiple ways, allowing for diverse avenues of action and expression. All this is basically saying we can, we can use neurodiversity, we can use strength-based approaches throughout the entire IEP process. Just to take one example, one common core state standard for seventh graders is to compare and contrast a text to an audio, video, or multimedia version of the test, text, analyzing each medium's portrayal of the subject, e.g. how the delivery of a speech affects the impact of the words. So for example, if we have a child who's been diagnosed with autism and we want to build in the idea of positive role models, we could have them watch Temple Grandin's famous TED talk uh, on neurodiversity and have her compare it to the text. The nice thing about YouTube is many of their videos have a written text that goes along with it, a, a text generator feature. So the student can look at both the video, the mass media or the multimedia and the printed text and do the various um, things that are suggested in that goal. Finally, having come to the end of the course, I'd like you to visualize where you'd like to go now with your understanding of neurodiversity. How would you like to apply it further in your own personal and or professional life? Just take a few moments to visualize or reflect on where you'd like to go with this. Thanks so much for 
spending the last 10 weeks with me. You've been tremendous students. I've really enjoyed interacting with you and learning from your own experiences and background and your great ideas. It's enlivened me as a teacher, I hope as much as it has you. So thanks again, and maybe we'll see you again sometime on another course. Take care.